Hello, friends. Hello, 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 friends. A tradition unlike any other. Oh, 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 oh my goodness. In your life have you seen anything like that? There it is! Adam Scott, a life changer. Mashed potato! Here it, here it, here it, here it comes. The team at Cobra Golf are set to introduce additions to its collection of king putters, making the offerings available in a sleek black colorway, the perfect complement to the limited edition black LTDX drivers and king black wedges. The lineup of black putters includes both king 3D printed and king vintage series models, along with two new mallet styles, the king Cuda and Cuda 40. All King Collection putters come standard with the Cobra Superstroke Traction Tour 2.0 grip and KBS Tour 120 shaft. The new additions to the King 3D printed and vintage series will be available from July this year. For more information on the entire King family of products, visit cobragolf.com. This is the 19th tee, Kieran Marsh, Nathan Drudy, back with you. Drudster, it's a pleasure to be joining you on this Monday evening. First and foremost, uh, we are at the beginning of Another major week, the PGA mm. Championship from Oak Hill Country Club in Rochester, New York State. Uh, the preview, of course, coming a little later this week. So if you've tuned in here uh, looking for your tips, you're going to have to hold another day or two uh, because we can't put the cart before the horse. It's been a wonderful weekend in Australian golf. We were staring down the barrel of three winners across the <laughs> globe there for, for a period of time. <laughs> Uh, and and thankfully we haven't come out with none, uh, but we've mm. come out with a first victory in one thousand eight hundred and thirty five days mm. for the new world number twenty, Jason Daydreads. An incredible, incredible story. Yeah, it it really is. Uh, you know, we started talking a little bit about this uh, on the the chat today, uh, which was. Um, you know, we were sort of talking about the significance of it, which I'm sure we'll get into. But um, yeah, it's it's massive, I think, for I guess for the main reason given that we had essentially we'd written Jason Day off mm. uh, maybe 12 months ago, I think, and I'd say that not only are we guilty of probably saying where the hell is he, what's the what's the plan for him, but I think more broadly the golf media had, and because for so long, you now his 2018 season was phenomenal. Um, and for so long, he was sort of the shining light of Australian golf. And um, fortunately slash unfortunately, whichever way you look at it, he's kind of been passed by Cam Smith and for a period there, Mark Leishman and, and such a wonderful talent coming through as well. So it's great to see him just bounce back. And I guess he's been building towards this for some time. The performances have been coming. And um, yeah, it, it's really great to see him holding a trophy once again. I think if you look at it uh, on volume since the turn of the new year, it's probably unsurprising. I feel like we've actually mentioned it a couple of times that, you know, he's been coming, the form has been building. I, I don't necessarily think it's any less impressive. Though. You know, I, I saw a, a tweet there from a good friend of the pod, Evan Priest, earlier today that he was 175th in the world at one stage last year. And we've spoken, uh, you know, probably – about different players through the course of this, you know, podcast over four or so years who've been in the wilderness. Jordan Spieth was there for a period of time, Ricky Fowler, um, probably more recently, uh, and himself on the way back. But J Day was, was right there. I mean, I don't think it was hyperbole for you to say today to me that we were at a point where, you know, do you continue to go on? And that's yeah. not necessarily even solely to where the game was at, it was where the body was at. Mm. Um, and, and a level of confidence as to whether or not it would return. He's done an awful lot of hard work. Uh, you know, you probably saw the most significant change um, moving to Chris Como as his coach, and, and uh, that's a uh, that's a name synonymous with success in golf. And I think tweaks, um, not just to, I suppose, his body and his health, but also clearly to his swing. And the work mm -hmm. he's been doing there have, have paid dividends because it's win number 13 on the PGA Tour, uh, as I flagged five years since his last, which was the Wells Fargo back in 2018, the year that you flagged he was playing so well. Uh, and in a nice bit of synergy, it was actually the first tournament he ever won, was the 18T Byron Nelson way back in 2010. So he's kind of come full circle. Uh, you know, we had spoken about his level of competitiveness that we anticipated at 
at Augusta and it wasn't to be, unfortunately. I don't necessarily think that Oak Hill sets up well for him uh, purely because I just don't think he hits the ball far enough. But, you know, you look at the remainder of the year, um, we've got uh, LACC for the US Open. We've got a, you know, he'll always compete well in Lynx golf um, over in the UK. So, you know, one of those two aren't out of his reach in the way he's playing um, given the, you know, relative strength of fields week in, week out with the differences between elevated and ele- elevated events. I don't think it'll be his last. Uh, mm. And, and that's, a, that's a really, really warming thing, I think, for Australian golf and, and for, for J Day personally. I think, um, you know, I know I know you mentioned it probably doesn't set up well for, for Oak Hill. If he plays the way he did this week, I mean, it may, it may, it may set up well. I mean, I, I agree his distance probably isn't there. There's no doubt about that, but he's he was 16th this week in strokes gained off the tee and third in strokes gained approach, and those are two critical stats at, at Oak Hill. So if he plays like that, he's certainly a um, he's certainly a chance, maybe not to win, but you know, be there or thereabouts. Mm. I, th- I I was having a bit of a think about this today while I was playing one of the slowest rounds of golf of my life, and <laughs> um, I, I there there was I imagine then that. Probably the thoughts that we were having about Jason Day 12, 18 months ago, Jason was probably having about himself as well. Yeah. And, and and that's based off purely nothing. I don't know the bloke at all, but I imagine that he might have been f- feeling a little bit similar. Um, And I think it kind of speaks volumes of the kind of guy that Jason Day is because I suggest that, when Live Golf was forming the Australian team, that he would have certainly been part of that conversation, right? And that's no disrespect to Matt Jones or our good friend Jed Morgan, but I would suggest that Live Golf would really have been hoping that Leishman Day and Smith would have, would have formed part of that. And I think for him to stay on the PGA Tour and then go on and win on the PGA Tour kind of speaks volumes about the the kind of player that, he wants to be and the legacy that he kind of wants to leave behind for Australian golf. And I just kind of thought of that as I was, yeah, wait, waiting on tee boxes today. And um, I think you, you summed it up really well. It's just, a, it's a warming feeling. It, it felt like, you know, that, that good cup of coffee in the morning, watching him lift that trophy today. <laughs> I, I felt, you know, it was, it was really, yeah, it was really pleasing to see. He was nails too, I think. Um, you know, yeah. coming down the stretch, uh, obviously the shot on 18 was necessary. I mean, a, a par there and we might have a different story, but to stick it two feet, uh, complete the birdie, give himself, you know, that two shot buffer going into the clubhouse, you know, he, he the par three 15th, um, he sticks it to, uh, you know, four or five foot and nails the birdie. And I think he chipped in off the, from off the green on 10 or 11, um, which, you know, I think the momentum never stopped is probably the point I'm trying to make. And, you know, Jason's probably been in a position to get himself toward a victory in the last six months. I think the most impressive thing was the pace um, and precision with which he finished the job this morning, um, Mm. our time in Australia. So, look, I agree. I mean, I I think to your point in terms of how close he came, he, he said it, he was quite candid after the round today that he, he said I was very close to quitting. Mm. Uh, and that, I think, shouldn't necessarily be understated by anyone who watched that. Now, this is a guy who, you know, for all intents and purposes, the, the, the purple patch that he went through, you know, that kind of 18 months or so in the mid-20-teens uh, when he was undoubtedly the best player in the mm. world, mm. unfortunately, you know, probably 18 months to two years too early for our podcast, but... <laughs> As Australian golf fans, it was a pleasure to watch. And I think that's what's probably been the most equally disappointing and frustrating part of the last three or four years is we knew what the ceiling was. Yeah. And he wasn't close. But if you think it was um, more frustrating for someone other than himself, you'd be kidding. So I I think that's the most pleasing thing is to see the smile on his face today. Uh, He's a player that I think we probably underappreciate in this country. And that's purely because I don't necessarily think he's, I don't say this as a slide on Jason. I don't think he's as popular as 
a Cam Smith or a Mark Leishman or an or an Adam Scott. Um, he's certainly their equal, if not better, uh, when it comes to a resume. Like he's uh, no disrespect to Leish, he's comfortably got Leish covered. Uh, you know, Smithy's gaining on him, but who knows what the decision to to switch to live does to that long term legacy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and Scotty's the only other one really there in terms of modern day Australian players. So he's a phenomenal asset to golf in this country. Uh, one that I'm not sure we'll genuinely appreciate maybe until a little while after he's done playing. I think, you know, also he uh, he's probably perhaps brought a little of that on himself, given that he Certainly. hasn't come back for, for many, if any, of the major events for the last sort of handful of years particularly. And we know that's kind of aligned to the birth of kids and all that sort of stuff as well. But mm. um uh, it just really clean golf, I think, kind of stood out. You know, I think three bogeys for the whole week, um, mm. it, you know, on a course that's not, you know, it's not the toughest course that, that we're going to play. And, and you know, I certainly appreciate that the the strength of field is not, you know, it's not the best field, of course, that happens the, before, the, the week before a major championship. So there's all that sort of stuff to consider. But I just, yeah, I just thought that, it was just clean and watching him play it. It felt like he was in control and maybe not watching the Jason day of 2018 or the late to 2010s. Um, but just, it looked like he was in control of his game, which I think has been lacking for, for so long, which was really, really pleasing. And yeah, I, I don't see why this can't maybe springboard him for another victory or, or, or a continued run of sustained success in terms of top, 10s 15s whatever that might be and um yeah uh it's it's so pleasing just to have another australian winner on the pga on the pga tour i mean it's the first australian winner that, of uh this season on the pga tour um you know we've had a lot of international winners but uh none of them have been australian so it's um yeah it's it's exciting for him to be back holding trophies and and Maybe kind of leading the charge for us on the on the uh, PGA Tour, anyway. I think it's really interesting. I suppose the point in his career that he's at now, mm-hmm. and and where the motivations are coming from. I think probably it's the natural arc of any player that tastes the level of success that he did so early in their career. Um, there's others that spring to mind in terms of. Someone like a, a Jordan Spieth who kind of raced out of the blocks. He was undoubtedly himself the best player in the world. Actually, when I think about it, the arcs are pretty similar between Chad mm-hmm. and, and Jordan Spieth. But I, I suppose uh, where I originated was a lot of the motivations are, ex, are extrinsic or external when you're at the beginning of your career in terms of yeah, you're young, you're hungry, you're about building reputation, about building legacy. Um when you get to a point in Jaday's career, you've won 12 times, you're a major winner, you've won a players, um, you're a father of four, soon to be five. I feel like the motivations very much become intrinsic. You're at a point of, can I can I get back? What left do I have to squeeze out of my game? I'm not necessarily, I don't need the bells and whistles. I'm not motivated by what comes with victories. I'm motivated by understanding whether or not I have what it takes to be the best in the world again. Sure. Um, And I wonder if that's a journey that's given him a little bit of a spring in his step in the last 18 months because it feels different, right? Like this is a guy who's who's certainly been let down by his body a lot um, in recent years and and it's clear that he's healthy again. uh, But it's also clear that he he seems to have a zest Mm. that he's not not had for a little while. Uh, And I, I just wonder if it's... It's been that journey, and yes, I can. I do still have what it takes to compete, and that really, you know, gets me up in the morning, so mm. to speak. So that's been really nice to see. Uh, just, I suppose, one more briefly for me on this, um, and not to get you know too sentimental, but sure. some really wholesome stuff I think kind of surrounded this. Um, you know, there was some really nice the pictures of Chase, his elder son. Uh, I think post the approach. To 18 and and as he walked up uh, knowing that he'd probably done enough for the tournament and then when he <laughs> sunk the birdie part you know it was it was really beautiful stuff to be honest like this yeah. is a kid who's grown up in our eyes you know we chase when he won his first tournament back in 2010 
um, was an infant, and we've you know we've he's taken that journey with his father and in the public eye, and to see him um, how excited he was for his dad, I think was really nice. And then equally, uh, it just so happened U.S. time to coincide with Mother's Day, sure, uh, and we know how important his mother Denny was to him. Um, this was actually the first victory that he's had since she passed. So mm. he's had 13 in his life. She experienced 12 with him. Uh, she unfortunately lost a battle with cancer um, in the last 12 months and and her name was actually on his caddy's bib uh, there today. So just some nice stuff. Uh, you know, we kind of mentioned, I think he's he's been a little bit of a maligned player. We as a country often feel like our international golfers um, owe us something. Sure. Uh, and, and we've been, I think, very fortunate in the sense that many of them do come home. Um, and for some reason, um, we feel differently about him because he doesn't. Uh, I don't think that makes him any less uh, likable in moments like that, where you see um, he, he showed a lot of vulnerability today and kind of talking through the depths that he's been in and, and what it's taken to get back and what a victory like that means, not just to him, but to those people around him. So I thought that was, yeah, really, really nice. No, that's well put. Very well put, I think. Yeah, echo everything that you've said there. There's probably not much more that I can add that uh, I just, is, is not going to pile on to your, to your piece. <laughs> I just wanted to ask you, I, I kind of uh, I messaged you earlier today to give you a little bit of thinking time while you were out playing one of the longest golf rounds in, in social golf history mm. uh, today. Um, where do you think it ranks in terms of wins of significance for Australian golfers in the last couple of years. So if you take out, we put to one side major victory. So put to one side his major victory, Smithy's Open Championship, even going all the way back to Scotty's win at the Masters. You excuse Hannah Gray and MG Lee's mm-hmm. major championships in the women's game. Are we just talking about regular run of the mill week in, yeah. week out on the PGA Tour? Um Where do you think it ranks? Because for mine, it's pretty high. I mean, I know that he's obviously also one of players, as has Smithy, uh, which, you know, the the fifth major, as they colloquially term it. But I think for mine, for all the reasons that we've spoken about and the journey to get back to here, it wasn't necessarily the strongest of fields because we are the week before a major, but it also wasn't empty. Yeah. Um, you know, Scotty Scheffler wasn't all that far behind him. Uh, and there were others that threatened. And I just think the way in which he's built back to this, for mine, it's without wanting to overstate it because it was the AT&T Byron Nelson at TPC Craig Ranch. It, it, it's an important win, mm. I think, in the context of not just him personally, but, um, you know, for, for the game more broadly. And I just wanted to get your take on where you think it ranks in terms of wins of significance mm. in the last couple of years by Aussies around the world. Well, I, I would tend to agree. I think for, for exactly what you said, everything that we've just spoken about in terms of the depth that he was at, potentially pull the pin. Let's like, what's what's the point? Why are we continuing to just can to roll up and miss cuts and and whatever? Um, I, I think you know it, it's hard to go past Smithy's win at the players is probably the most significant win in the last couple of years, I feel, taking the majors out. But I agree that it's right up there. There's no doubt that 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 it that it is for all the reasons that we've outlined. And I think I think that should probably be similar across everyone should have similar feelings around that, just given, mm. you know, where he has come from. And I don't want to, you know, again, had plenty of thinking time today. And it's not um, I don't think it's the same sort of um, the levels that Tiger was at right when he came back and obviously won the Masters a couple of years ago. No, but no. there's similarities to that, right? Given the injury toll that Jason Day's had, he was truly in, in the depths of, you know, probably if he hadn't have won a major in 2018, would have been on the verge of losing his card ultimately. Um and so for him to then come back and compete and we kind of saw this trend and we thought, well, maybe he might come back and just continue to finish in the top 10. But to come out and win, I think it is quite significant for him and particularly given that we have had some of our better Australian golfers leave the PGA Tour 
for him to to stand up and kind of fly the flag for us, I do think it is quite a significant victory, all in all things considered. So yeah, I, I'm probably on the same wavelength as you. Yeah, I mean, I think if, obviously we only spoke a fortnight ago about Hannah Green kind of breaking through after herself being um, through a period of poor form, and that was great. I think it feels different as well to say, you know, the early wins for a Lucas Herbert or a Minwoo Lee or sure. A, Steph Kiriaki on the Ladies European Tour, or even Grace Kim's first win a couple of weeks ago on the LPGA. First wins are different because I think without wanting to put too much pressure on those individuals, there's an element of a matter of when, not if. But sure. we, we see enough in those games to expect that they're going to have a victory on those tours mm-hmm. and continue to progress. This kind of, to your point, um, and to a number of the ones we've made so far, we went through not a short period of time where we genuinely um, doubted whether he'd win again mm-hmm. and whether he had the game to challenge and compete. So I, I think it I think it feels different. I think understanding, you know, his battle against his body hasn't necessarily been private. It's been very public. He's, you know, he's literally had to withdraw from tournaments that we've seen, you know, mm-hmm. the body seize up and give up on him. So uh, understanding the depths, I think it's to get him back to here and play um, not necessarily on a quality course, but against a pretty quality field the week before a major. Yeah. It's, um, it's a significant one for mine. So, yeah, no, agree. Um, just briefly before we move off the Byron Nelson, a couple of quick things in terms of the other Australians in the field, a good week for Scotty uh, mm. T eight. He is certainly trending uh, in the right direction. Uh, again, I think he's probably a little better suited to Oak Hill than J-Day, only marginally. I don't necessarily think it sets up well for him, but, geez, I love I love the LA Country Club for Adam Scott. Mm-hmm. I really do at mm-hmm. the US Open. So, mm-hmm. one to watch. Uh, in terms of other Aussies, Aaron Badley tied for 23rd, Harrison Endicott, T50. want to stop here mm-hmm. um, for a moment, and people might find T67 an unusual place to pause, uh, but it is important for our great friend, uh, Mika, David Michaluzzi. So, what what a whirlwind couple of weeks it's been. Uh, obviously, we spoke to him um, not too long ago before he was making the trip over to Korea to play that event on the European Tour. This event, the Byron Nelson, was always on the cards. We spoke about that um, in that conversation. And then just before this event got underway, uh, the news broke that he had been accepted into the field for Oak Hill and will make his major debut this week in the... 2023 PGA Championship. Off the back of that news, he comes out and shoots it. Was it 65 on yep. the opening day? Mm-hmm. Um, yep. And I think he was in a tie for sixth after yep. the first round in his yep. PGA Tour debut, mm-hmm. if you don't mind. Uh, obviously, things fell away a little and didn't necessarily... Mick is generally known for um, finishing better than he starts, and it kind of went the other way this week. But mm-hmm. you forgive him that in terms of the level of excitement and probably nerves, I imagine, in his maiden start on the PGA Tour. But just awesome news. Like, and that's, we spoke in chapter and verse with him about how dominant he was across the Australian summer. It's really pleasing to see Drew as that being rewarded with starts and quality tournaments. Yeah, yeah, so good. You know, um, highlight for him will no doubt be the uh, the third hole, which was actually his 12th hole on um, the first day with a hole out eagle uh, on the par four. I think it was about 135 yards in. Um, led led the field in, in strokes gained, approached the green, uh, unsurprisingly after the first round um, and, you know, sort of finished inside the top 20 there. And it was really just the putting that kind of let him down. He was, he was losing four shots on the field on that uh, in the, in that category. Sorry. And, you know, but he, he put himself, in decent positions, I feel, you know, there's a lot of two putts. You look at his scorecard today, I think there's only maybe a couple of birdies and a bogey. So lots and lots of pars. Um, so he's putting himself in position to to actually score. So um, yeah, it's, it's invaluable experience, isn't it? For, for a guy like him, um, who I'm sure to your point was very nervous, but also mega excited at the same time. And um, yeah, I'm sure that that's only going to be, two or three fold this week as uh, as he gets ready to tee up at Oak Hill. Yes. Uh, we have obviously spoken 
Uh, part to obviously first and foremost pass on our congratulations to Mika. Um, hopefully, try and get some time. I'd suggest it's unlikely in the lead up to uh, he's got significantly more important things to do than speak to the two of us. Yeah, in the lead up to his um, debut at a major, but we should uh, and hopefully will snag some time with him host. So it'll be great to kind of try and grab him and talk through his first experience. I and mean, this is a guy who was excited. Not that he shouldn't have been, but it was excited four or five weeks ago about potentially playing a practice round with John Rahm yeah. prior to the Open Championship. And he finds himself in the field this week uh, for the second men's major of the year, which is yeah. great news. Um, just finishing off, Druids, in terms of Australians, uh, the snake, Greg Chalmers, was the only other Aussie to make the cut. Tie for 70, Jeff Ogilvy, Cameron Percy, and Minwoo Lee all missed it. Anything yeah. else from TPC Craig Ranch in Dallas? Uh Sorry, I, I'm going to have one more thing Go. before I do it. Do it. Take off. Um, we are recording this Monday evening, so I have no further news. Um, and probably going to have egg on our faces because off the back of this, we're going to record our preview of the PGA Championship that comes out later in the week. Mm-hmm. However, um, the big news pre-tournament was the withdrawal of Jordan Spieth. Uh, this is his home ground. You know, he's a Dallas local. He loves this tournament. AT&T is one of his sponsors. It's the first time he's ever missed. This is the tournament that he made his PJ to a debut, I think, at 15 or 16 years of age. Uh, he's never missed this tournament. Withdrew, I think it was the Tuesday, in the lead-in with a wrist injury, um, which he said he's been carrying for some time. Um, I say this with the greatest respect to uh, the Byron Nelson and also to his sponsor, AT&T. Couldn't give a rat's ass that he missed this week. <laughs> Uh, my concern is that it comes, you know, 10 days out from a major championship. Mm. So the watch is on. Mm. Uh, again, I don't necessarily love Oak Hill for Jordan. And if it means resting up and getting himself right for LACC, where I think he is maybe a lock, if I'm honest. But, um, yeah, I just, just want to say the watch is on, um, as it always is this close to a major with, with my man, Jay Money. Uh, but, yeah, a, a slightly concerning withdrawal uh, due to injury just 10 days out from a major. Yes, I will tend to agree. Tend to agree. So hopefully he doesn't, with, second, hopefully second, doesn't withdraw out of that the, be, uh, the major. That would be preferable. Um, Drew, it's the LPGA. So we kind of flagged at the start that we almost had three winners. Uh, yes. well, that's what we were staring down the barrel of. Minji Lee, uh, some mm. outstanding. Uh, 68, 69, 67. Uh, I believe she held the 54-hole lead um, and didn't finish too strongly. 71 today, ultimately loses in a playoff to Jin Young Ko. I mean, mm-hmm. that's the worst players in the world to lose a playoff to than Jin Young Ko. But it was Jin Young Ko's 67 today in the final round of the Cognizant Founders Cup. Played at the Upper Mount Clare Country Club in New Jersey that put her into a playoff with Minji, uh, and she was ultimately successful, but very exciting. I mean, yeah, she, Minji was nails, as I said, through 54 holes, 68, 69, 67, to hold that lead. Um, unfortunately, just didn't finish with the special source today, Drew. It's very, very close, though, for, for the West Aussie. Yeah, uh, the bogey on 16, obviously, you know, really, really hurt. And then, yeah, just couldn't. Couldn't uh, find a birdie in the final two holes while Jin Young Ko was starting to heat up, and yeah, ultimately took that momentum into the uh, into the playoff. But um, yeah, it's, it looked disappointing because she had a. I think I flicked on when she had maybe a two or three shot lead, so with only a couple of holes to go. So for um, you know the the shot swing to happen um, coming down the stretch is not ideal, and I'm sure she'll be disappointed because she. I'm sure she'll feel like she let one slip, but um, yeah, still another top five that she can add to her incredible career that she's carving out for herself. And look, she'll be disappointed. You always are when you hold that kind of lead and a back nine and don't manage to get the job done. I would say perspective about how she's playing um, with four women's majors remaining in the year. Mm. That's the important stuff, particularly for someone like Minji. Like Minji's a you know a top 10 on her day, top five player in the women's game in the world. Mm. She's reached that level now where, yeah, wins week in, week out on the LPGA are nice in terms of status and topping up the bank account, but it's not what matters. Mm-hmm. You know, what matters is the majors. So it's good 
and a very promising sign to see her playing the way she is without necessarily getting the job done this week in the context mm. of what remains in terms of the important tournaments on the LPGA remaining this season. Uh, I do want to flag the other women in the field mm. from an Australian perspective. Grace Kim, T10, if you don't mind, um, you know, coming up uh, not too long after her maiden victory in Hawaii just a few weeks ago. Sarah Kemp, T13, Karis Davis, and T31, Steph Kuriaku, also T31. Uh, Kempi and, and Steph, they're coming off a great performance in the International Crown um, just last week as we as we flag. So uh, Aussie women doing great things on the LPGA, Drudes, um, all round. That's a, that's a good crop there, performing well as a group. Yeah, well, uh, just awesome. Awesome. I mean, particularly highlighting uh Grace, um, Karis and Steph, you know, sort of the three next generation talents, I guess, to have them all mm-hmm. A making the cut and and uh B sort of being there or thereabouts. Um obviously Hannah Green missed the cut at the, that event. But uh, you know, when you put names like um Steph Karras, uh Sarah Kemp, Grace Kim and Minji Lee alongside Hannah Green, uh yeah, the the women's game is in very, very good hands at the minute. Off to live. Uh, yeah. And this, I mean, I, I, I won't lie in the sense I probably only got excited about this today mm-hmm. um, and probably only got excited about this in Cam Smith's back nine because he was, in fact, five shots off the lead uh, as he rounded the turn to play his second nine. Uh, he took a one-shot lead with a birdie on the last at six, uh, 61. Nine birdies, uh, no bogeys today. Mm-hmm. Yes. Tulsa. Pretty, uh, pretty incredible. It goes on to uh, play in a three-way playoff against Dustin Johnson and Brandon Grace, mm-hmm. uh, which unfortunately DJ wins. Uh, <laughs> I mean, not unfortunately for any DJ fans out there, but for us here uh, at the bottom of the earth, we would have loved to see Smithy, uh, not least of which to, to top up the account, get the job done. But I think for me, this is most important in the context of what's coming this week because this sort of form wasn't present prior to Augusta. I think we talked ourselves into the fact that that didn't matter, particularly given his previous performances in the Masters. And it turns out it did because he was poor. So to see him playing like this, um, you know, a week out from... The PGA Championship, I think, bodes well. I think it's also a little bit scary that Dustin Johnson is starting to <laughs> just tick things over nicely as well. Um, yeah. I mean, this is the world we live in, and, and obviously we'll get into it um, a little more uh, in our major preview that we're going to record very shortly. But um, uh, it, it's so hard to assess now that now that the golf world is so fragmented, I'm finding it. You know, normally we'd be able to go, okay, this player's here and there, and you know, it's it's like trying to essentially assess a V8 supercar driver against a Formula One car driver and try and work out who the better one is, and it's and it's very difficult to do. So, I think, uh, yeah, for Smithy, um, you know, he he absolutely flew home today, as you said, um, and yeah, there's no doubt that that will um, hold him in good stead for. Uh, this coming week at Oak Hill, but yeah, just wanted to mention DJ there. It's a little bit, a little bit nervy that I think he might be, uh, he might be firing on uh, all four cylinders. I think. Tend to agree. Tend to agree. Um, just briefly before we do a few little housekeeping matters yep. to um, to wrap up the show, I just wanted to to briefly mention, and it might have been something um, that didn't necessarily cross the radar of a lot of golf fans, but for mine it was worth noting. Uh, and that was the running of the G4D Open, Drudes, over the weekend. Um, okay. The G4D Open was the first official British Open for golfers with disability. Uh, oh. at, And it was, uh, I mean, if you've kind of tapped in, and I, I put my hand up, this is probably not something we've done enough of, um, previously in the past, we've got some outstanding Australian golfers with disability uh, that we probably and absolutely should be doing a better job of of covering. But this kind of came across um, my screen this week. Um, and I think a great initiative by the RNA um, 
first and foremost, and they deserve their congratulations to hold the G4 Day Open um, and and carve out an official British Open for golfers with disability. Uh, but some great names. Uh, it was actually won by the Irishman, Brendan Lawler. Who is yes, I was just going to say, did he win? <laughs> he did, yes. He's the number two ranked uh, male, the official world rankings for golfers with disability. Um, people listening to this may be familiar with Brendan. He's actually played in a number of DP World Tour events mm. um, where he's received status and done quite well. It's also quite timely. Uh, I'm not sure if you tapped into this, but he played recently uh, at the ISPS Handed Championship in Japan, the event that Lucas Herbert won. Um, and unfortunately, quite disgustingly really, he was the subject of some online abuse um, kind of off the back of playing in that tournament. And the DP World Tour, to their credit, and Brendan, to his credit, had kind of got on the front foot on that issue in, in the week leading up to the G4D Open, uh, where he spoke quite openly about it. Um, he, was, he was fantastic. He, he kind of, he's kind he got a very thick skin. He's grown up his whole life with disability. It's nothing that he hadn't heard, but he kind of hoped in speaking out that he would bring awareness to it and understand that not all players on that tour uh, are as, I suppose... Thick skinned as he is, sure, and, and that abuse of that nature, derogatory, um, you know, to the extreme is is not acceptable. And I think it it's probably just a really nice piece of symmetry that he got on the front foot. He was really open in talking about it, and he actually goes on and and serves the best message to those clowns by actually winning this yeah. tournament, um, mm. which is fantastic. So, I just wanted to call it out. There were a couple of um, Aussies in the field. Lachlan Wood finished uh, in a tie for eighth. Jeff Nicholas. In a tie for 23rd, Cameron Pollard, uh, 30th, and Adam Leatherbarrow in 71st. Uh, Rod Mori has written a fantastic piece on the G4D Open uh, on the Golf Australia magazine, uh, website golfstraday.com.au if you want to get a little bit more. Uh, the fantastic piece from Rod Mori, but I just wanted to call that out. I thought that was a fantastic initiative from the RNA. Um, well won by Brendan Lawler and some great... Australian performances there by the Aussie Quartet who participated in the G4D Open. Yeah, well, good uh, good work calling that one out. He's yeah, he's he's a gun player, Brandon Law. He is. He can, he can hit a ball. He can hit a ball a long way. Um, yeah, good to watch. Where do you want to go next? What's uh, what are we up to? Well, we launched. I shouldn't say launched. I mean, soft soft launch. It's not like a the unveiling of a new motor vehicle or the next Apple iPhone. But we, we tried we posted something on, We posted on social media is what we did. Yeah, stop the presses. Uh, we tried something a little different last week, something we're going to introduce uh, moving forward, posting, pending our schedules. Um, mm. Obviously, when I say our, I'll probably mean yours. Uh, but uh, <laughs> pending the schedules, posting on either a Friday or a Saturday, a question of the week. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, we went... With a bit of a Dorothy, Dorothy Dixer, bit of a softball wonder, open yep. us up. Uh, yeah, but the the idea of this is to generate a bit of conversation. Now, some of them will be issues uh, at the heart of the game. Some of them will be a bit more lighthearted. But you and I have come up with a list of questions mm-hmm. that we, we that we think you're likely to have an opinion on. Sure. We wouldn't necessarily be putting it out there if we didn't feel people felt strongly one way or the other. Um, and the idea being, we just want to generate a bit of you know conversation across the 19th podcast channel so we let off with uh in your opinion what is the best golf course in the country i mean mm. shit if you want to draw a line in the sand early um yeah that's that's one way to do it it's it's a <laughs> often polarizing topic um best is subjective uh, because mm. best means different to so many different people mm. uh and and whether or not you think it's genuinely the best course or maybe it's just the most enjoyable golfing experience you've had, I think we had some great answers. Mm. So I don't know if you, you've got a couple that you want to run through. Uh, yeah. But just suffice to say, we'll be posting one of these a week and the idea will be that we'll reserve a little bit of time on the Monday evening weekend review to share a few of what we yes. feel are the, the most entertaining or the, or the best um, bracket subjective best uh, answers yeah. to these questions. Well, I think, you know, common theme is Royal Melbourne West, um, which Shocker. I think, um, you know, <laughs> probably you and I would 
potentially tend to agree with it. I don't want to speak on your behalf, yeah. but um, I think it's hard to obviously go past Royal Melbourne West. I think it's also hard when you haven't played those courses to to kind of understand and appreciate it. Um, I was thinking like, what's the best course that I've I've played, right? Like, you know, I think Royal Melbourne West is the best course in Australia, having seen it, not played it. So, you know, it's it's obviously a little different. Um, New South Wales Golf Club, got to mention, I think, you know, the views there are just phenomenal. I think that is also to be taken into account. Uh, lots of, um, you know, the Sand Belt, Victoria, Metro, um, others like Barwon Heads, Lonsdale Lynx, uh, Bamboogle was a very to- uh, popular pick, which is one of the best sort of public access ones. St. Andrews Beach got a, a couple of mentions um, Meadow Springs, um, over here in WA is, yeah, is a, is a phenomenal public track. It's a sister course to Joondalup Resort. Um, it's a really, really good track. Um, I, I do want to call out a couple of the, the ones of people who, you know, didn't go for your big, your big hitters and they've just gone for their locals, which I, which I do love. I mean, Hillview Golf Course over here got a call. Got a call out <laughs> Royal Hill View, which is where I grew up playing many golf. Still haven't come into the 21st century with online bookings though. Um, <laughs> so Burwood Pines commented themselves, which I do love. Um, I love that. Yeah, that's good gear from them. Uh, who else? Uh, oh, um, Dane at Toyota. Um, he commented uh, Royal Gulgawi nine whole sand green <laughs> course which i love um so yeah I, I had yeah there was a similar one that i had a, a direct submission um, okay not via the podcast channels but uh brilliant uh Car- carrara par three okay uh, carrara is in fact the suburb on the gold coast where uh formerly metricon now heritage bank stadium is where the gold coast <laughs> Suns play their football and the carrara par three uh, that gave me a genuinely good giggle um, from the person who, who sent me that message yep. i also loved uh, i got a message from a uh, good friend of this podcast and people in your neck of the woods would know him if they're looking for a lesson, go find our good friend, Braden McCubbing. Um, yes. I love this. He he said Ratho Farm, which for people who don't know is actually the oldest golf course in the country. Yes. Uh, in the in the heart of Tasmania. He did follow it up with Or Burgle Run, uh, which is one of the options at Barn Burgle. But, you know, this is a man who's played a bit of golf in Tasmania. There's a lot down there in terms of the entire Barn Burgle estate. Um, obviously you've also got um, the, the courses on their way, but he, he's nominated uh, the oldest course in the country, little old mm. Ratho Farm in the middle of Tassie, uh, yeah. which I know is, is high on both yours and my list. So, yes, um, yeah, I enjoyed that. And I think, as I said, this is kind of what we're trying to do is generate a little bit of discussion, but it's personal. Uh, yeah. And that's that's one of the great things, whether or not more more often – we, you and I were ironically having a conversation before we hit record about hats. And I think it's yeah. kind of similar, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You will go to a place, I think, when someone says, what's the best course in the country? Pound for pound, it might not actually aesthetically be the best. It might not be the best condition. But for you, it's yeah. the best experience yes. you've had. And it's, yeah. the, it's the most enjoyable golf you've played often is, is there. So I really enjoyed that to kick us off. Uh, we will have a few more light-hearted ones sure um not that that's serious but there's some genuine um what i would call divisive questions in the game yes that that do invoke a little bit of a giggle as well so keep an eye out for that we encourage you to uh to submit an answer each and every week and as i said we will devote some time on the monday evening shows to take a look back at uh, those answers uh Drew's just one more briefly before we wrap up uh, the preview podcast, of course, we, we flagged at the beginning. We are at the start of uh, major week, the mm. 2023 PGA Championship at the Oak Hill Country Club. Uh, as per tradition, we'll have our major preview coming up at the back end of the week. As part of that, a uh, bit of a giveaway. So yes. we haven't done a giveaway in a little while. No. Um, but we've do, we've got some product. Um, this is going to be great for the people who only listen to us from an audio medium perspective. But I've got... A bucket load of boxes of sunnies. I'm doing my best to hold them up to the Zoom screen yeah, here. Yeah. I've got a lot of boxes of sunnies from our good friends at Oakley. Uh, and I've also got a number of boxes of balls from our good friends at Callaway as well. Um, yep. Who, who um, semi-occasionally send us a box of balls. 
So uh, we will be giving away a box of balls, not of your choice, just the ones that I have. But then we've got <laughs> probably seven or eight different pairs of Oakley Sunnies here. So you will have a choice of the uh, style, I suppose, of sunglass you would like to take away. So a uh, pair of Sunnies, box of balls, uh, and that will go to you – know, this is what you need to do. You need to nominate a winner. You mm-hmm. need to nominate a score because I imagine we'll have a number of people who select the same person. And obviously, we'll go closest to without going over. That will yes. be the rule. Yes. Closest to without going over. I think that's an important stipulation. Uh, you then need to tag a friend. I mean, because obviously, we don't have any original ideas here on this podcast. No. And make sure you're following, of course, uh, both ourselves, which I assume you will be, because that's how you will have seen the giveaway, uh, and our great friends at, at Oakley as well. So that's the... That's the stipulations, the terms, the T's and C's, as the people in legal um, mm. make sure we have that, uh, you know, straight up and down. So, winner, score, closest to that going over, tag a friend, make sure you're following us in Oakley, and the closest to will walk away with a pair of Oakley sunnies of their choice and a box of Callaway balls. And if I no one, that's... and if no one gets it, we'll double it and give it to the next person. Yes, double or nothing. That's exactly right because we've got enough sunnies and enough boxes of balls yes. to do just that. So, yeah, double or nothing when we head to the LA Country Club at the US Open. But I imagine, um, I think we'll probably have a winner. I'd yeah. be very surprised. Very, I think very we surprised. will as well. I think we will. All right. That's probably us. Yes. We've got another we've got episode to record. So if people we watch do. this on the YouTubes, they'll notice that we are wearing the exact same thing because the recording session started about 30 seconds after this one ended. Yes, yeah, so I hadn't planned on doing a wardrobe change, so thanks no. for pointing that out. That's good. That's good stuff. All right, Drutes, uh, thank you for your company. Congratulations to Jason Day on win number 13. Fantastic to see Jay Day with a smile on his face and back in the winner's circle. And speaking of back, we'll be back in your ears in a few nights' time for our official 2023 PGA Championship preview.